Never seen such a war. Johnny Reb don't get you the engines well. He'll get this California gold through. General Grant will have our scalps anyway. Push him through, Sergeant. Yes, sir, Lieutenant. I see that I'm on the right road and mine is a light load for me. Thanks, thanks to the heroes before me. I'm free as the breeze. I go wherever I please with my song along Freedom Road. Gone are the dark days of the war between the states. Gone, too, are the rumbling wagon wheels on the old pioneer trails. Today, other wheels are rolling on the superhighways of modern America. This is a story of America and some of the people along the way. The people could be you or me or the neighbor next door. That is, all except one. The story begins on a California highway near San Francisco. Meet Jimmy Rollins of Seattle on his way to Washington, D.C. and his first Boy Scout jamboree. He's getting a king-size thrill out of the ever-changing view of America through these big picture windows. How's it look to you so far, son? It's the greatest. But take this highway, for instance. It follows the coast all the way down to San Diego. And then remember, it's the same road the Spaniards followed almost 200 years ago. Only they call it El Camino Real, King's Highway. Try and imagine how it looked then. You mean, with Spaniards on horseback? In your own mind's eye, ah, yes. Fred Schroeder of Portland, Oregon, also has his place in this story of America. Summoned to the nation's capital to receive a medal for his only son, Fred Schroeder should be a proud man. He isn't. <laughs> Look at that. It's the longest single span bridge in the world. Gee whiz. Aren't you even going to look at it? Look at what? It's only the Golden Gate Bridge. Only? Sure doesn't look like the Old West. Well, maybe not here and now, but they tell me you should have seen it a hundred years ago. San Francisco was the Old West then. I see that street sign up ahead? Street. Behind that sign, I see Sutter's Mill, the Valley of the Sacramento. The year is 1848. John Sutter's workmen were digging a new mill race in the river and found gold. Sutter tried hard to keep it quiet, knowing it meant trouble. But it was like fighting a prairie fire with a bucket. People came from everywhere, from way beyond the far Missouri, the Mississippi, and the Monongahela.
Even the Rockies couldn't stop the rush for gold. Where there was no road, it was block and tackle, and just plain old willpower. Skimming over our highways today in air-conditioned comfort, it's hard to realize what those 49ers went through to get here. A lot of them didn't make it, but the rest kept coming. It went on and on until the river of the Sacramento and all the runs and creeks were swarming with men seeking California gold. Gee, I can almost see it. Boy, I wonder what happened to all that gold. I can tell you what happened to some of it. This man is another figure in our story of America, perhaps the greatest of them all. Mark him well. In his way, he is to affect the lives of several people. During the war between the states, both the North and the South badly needed that gold. Once General Grant sent a detachment to bring through a wagon train of it. They were massacred by Indians. It's all part of our American history now, Jimmy. History we can be proud of. How would you know my name was Jimmy? Isn't he a little young for propaganda? Well, I never thought of patriotism as having an age limit. Why shouldn't we be proud of our history, Mr. Schroeder? Even as late as that of Korea. What do you mean by that? San Francisco Terminal, 40 minutes for lunch. Well, Jimmy, let's see what's on the menu, huh? Bye. So long, Jimmy. Say hello to the president for me. Where did I pick him up? That's your number, 14? No, young fellow, that's my safety record. Like you earn a badge in scouting. That means I've driven for 14 years and never even been a defender. You must be pretty good. Oh, there are plenty longer records than that. The men who drive for Greyhound are proud they've made it the safest transportation in the land. Who's the proprietor around here? Where to, please? Philadelphia. Thank you. Hi there, General. Hey, aren't you Bill Roberts of the Philadelphia Eagles? Could be. Excuse me. Oh, he's a professional football player. Got it. Thank you. Thank you. Fumble. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> That's all right. Wrong way Roberts does it again. Thank you. Thanks, Coach. Philly for a week to sign the contract, so I thought I'd see the country. I hear it's quite a country. It is. You, uh, you live in New York? I work there. I've been home on vacation in San Francisco. Me too. What do you know? A couple of natives and we got to go out of town to meet. <laughs> Funny, isn't it? Say, look, it's only a hop from Philadelphia to New York. How about seeing the big town together? Why, um, uh, I, uh, I'll be pretty busy. Oh. Oh, I see. Guess I was offside, huh? <laughs> Mind if we have a little talk? What about? You have a problem, so have I. I thought we might be able to help each other find the answers. I know the answer to mine. Are you sure you didn't look in the back of the wrong book? Hey, Bill, look at this. Excuse me, my public. <laughs> look, there's another one. Route of the Pony Express. It's all right here in my book. Riders of the Pony Express. That's right, Sacramento was the western end of it, you know. And St. Joe, Missouri was the eastern end. Here it is. Listen. The first telegraph line had been strung as far west as St. Joe, Missouri. From then on, the mail had to be carried by stagecoach. It was 2,000 miles from St. Joe to Sacramento. It took weeks and months, and then they didn't always get through. That's when the Pony Express was organized. People said it couldn't be done, but it was. 
80 daring young riders, many in their teens, and 500 thoroughbred horses. They had stations on the way, so a rider could change horses every 30 to 40 miles. These pony riders would start out from St. Joe with a pistol and a prayer book, and the Sacramento Maine. No matter what the difficulties, the dangers, or the obstacles, the riders went through. Boy, was that terrific. You know, you could almost see those ponies. I wish I would have been living then. How old are you, young man? Thirteen, sir. Thirteen. Ten years ago. He liked the West, too. Who, Mr. Schroeder? He was a Boy Scout. We couldn't wait to get him in uniform, either. Easy, Schroeder. Look this guy. Don't you like this country, mister? No, Bill. If you want to fight for it, they'll give you a uniform, too. I put mine away after Korea. Any more questions? I think it's time for some answers, Bill. Mr. Schroeder's only son was killed in Korea. We just found out how. The boy's been awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. Mr. Schroeder's on his way to Washington to accept it. I'm sorry, sir. I didn't know. I didn't know anybody. Congressional Medal of Honor. Gosh, that's the highest there is. Is it? You know, this is one of the few towns in the world that never sleeps. They all come here to gamble. Or because they have gambled and lost. You mean? I mean, a person ought to be real sure she's marrying the right guy. Waldo's a fine man, and he has good prospects, too. Waldo? Besides, he's my boss. Oh, I'm sure he's a good, dependable guy, but do you have fun together? Of course. Well, not frivolous, but. Oh, well, frivolous is the best kind sometimes. That's where I could be a help. Where's the rest of your troops, son? They lost too? No, sir. They went on ahead. My dog was sick and I couldn't leave till he got better. Oh, good for you, son. I like a fella I could depend on, even if I was a dog. Say, aren't you Tex Ritter? The movie cowboy? That's my brand. I saw you get on at Laramie. Having on personal appearances, uh, Denver and places. I wish I could hear you in person. Well, could you? Well, now, maybe I could. Just one short one. Uh, did you ever hear the legend of the Alamo? I don't know. Did you ever hear of Davy Crockett? Oh, sure. <laughs> well, this is song here is about Davy and the Alamo. Now, you try to imagine that you're in San Antonio, Texas, uh, while I sing about it. Alamo and the stubborn band that stood in the path of invasion. A hundred and eighty were challenged by Travis to die. By the line that he drew with the sword when the battle was nigh. And young David Crockett was first to cross over with a gallantry fierce in his eye. For God and for freedom, a man more than willing to die. We're killing your soldiers below That men, wherever they go Will remember the Alamo They sent a young scout Through the battle much bloody and loud 
With the words of farewell from a garrison valiant and proud. Grieve not, little darling, my dying, if Texas is sovereign and free. We'll never surrender and devil with liberty be. Santa Ana, we're killing your soldiers below. That men, wherever they go, will remember the Alamo. Even our songs glorify senseless sacrifice. What good did it do those few men to fight on when they knew they'd all be killed anyway? If I'd known the answer to that for sure, I wouldn't be here. I don't understand you. You will. Before this trip's over, I promise you. Honest, Mary. That's the way it is. Oh, Bill. Right when I thought I had my life all planned and ordered. Why did you have to come along? I'm awful glad I did. Aren't you? I don't know. Now, that's why I like this kind of travel. To me, every mile of America is a magnificent mile, especially when you can see it close up like we're doing. fresh out of. Gee, Mary, I can't let you just walk out of my life. This trip will be over before you know it. You see? We're coming into Chicago now. That's Lake Michigan. Oh? Yeah, that lake saved a good many lives once. It did? To look at it the way it is today, it's hard to realize that right here in 1871 was the scene of the most destructive fire there ever was. Thousands of people saved themselves from wading out into the lake, where the smoke turned day into night and the flames turned night into day, all because Ms. O'Leary's cow kicked over that land. But the city rebuilt, bigger and better than ever with only a few landmarks left to show where the great fire was. Well, I see we're pulling in. I'll be leaving you in Chicago. You can get off and look around if you want to. You'll have a little time here. Well, then goodbye, Mr. Ritter. Just wait till the troop here as I rode this far with you. <laughs> Pleasure's all mine, Jimmy. Be a good scout. Oh, well, goodbye, Tex. So long, partner. Say, I know where I've seen you before. Is that so? But you in my outfit, the old second division. Well, we'll have lunch in Cleveland. Cleveland already? Why is it time flies so when you're happy and drags so when you're unhappy? Ought to be the other way around. <sighs> Hurry up when you're unhappy and slow down when you're... Happy so you can enjoy it. You're a funny girl. I mean, funny peculiar or funny ha-ha. I mean, funny wonderful. Hey, Bill. Oh, so it's pirates now, huh? You know, I've been down where a lot of these fellas used to hang out. Honest? Where? Florida Keys. Keys? Yeah, that's a string of islands off the southern tip of the United States. They're connected by a series of bridges, making a highway almost 100 miles long as the crow flies, stretching right out over the ocean, all the way to Key West. These islands were said to be part of the old Spanish main. Like it says here in your book, among these keys and coves, buccaneers used to lie in wait till a fat merchantman came along or a rival pirate crew whereupon they would grapple in a furious fight.
a lot of buried treasure down there. Could be. Of course, the important thing is to recognize a treasure when you find one. We certainly made good time on the Pennsylvania Turnpike. Are you getting in a hurry now that your trip's almost over? Oh, no. I mean... I mean, I'm really enjoying seeing the country. Well, uh, remember one thing. In this country, a woman has a right to change her mind. And we're coming to another post house. Last stop before Philadelphia. Well, if we'd have been here 180 years ago, we might still have eaten Philadelphia Scrapple and uh, cherry pie. I doubt if we'd have been drinking iced coffee. No. There wouldn't have been this many people, I bet. Oh, well, you're right. Although the uh, roads were all pretty well traveled in 1776, bringing delegates to the Continental Congress. They came from all corners of the 13 colonies, by stage, by colonial coach, and by horseback. Men who were on their way to keep their date with history. And naturally, there were delegates from Boston to report firsthand on Massachusetts' answer to the stamp tax. A secret organization of patriots. Uh, we call them underground today. Sons of Liberty staged the famous Boston Tea Party. Disguised as Indians, they threw three shiploads of heavily taxed tea into the harbor. So the delegates were gathering in a building that still stands in Philadelphia. Their meetings were stormy and exciting. Some of the colonists felt they weren't being so badly treated by standards of the old country. But over here, the people were beginning to breathe the exhilarating air of freedom. It was a new idea in the world, and they liked it. But it was a dangerous idea to espouse. The signing of the Declaration of Independence, making all men free and equal. so large a signature, my friend. So John Bull may read my name without his spectacles. We must hang together, or else most assuredly we'll all hang separately. You can see that same Liberty Bell in Philadelphia today, in Independence Hall, where America became the first free nation on Earth. Hey, I want to go get some chewing gum. Go ahead. We'd better get back to the bus. I imagine your son was a lot like that. A lot. I have an idea. You know, there are shrines and memorials to all our wars. America is still paying the price for liberty even to this year of 1900 and now. Let's get to the point. Gladly. I think we ought to take a short side trip, you and I. There's a bus waiting. Trust me. You'll be glad of it the rest of your life. All right. So it is that when the rest of the party rolls into Philadelphia, Schroeder and the friendly stranger are missing. And these two have a problem of their own growing more acute by the moment. Okay. I'll stick around while you phone him. Yes. Yes, dear. All right. Goodbye, Waldo. Did you tell him about us? I couldn't. Not just like that. Maybe that'll help you make up your mind. Thanks. It does. You and your football manners. So 
it is with confused emotions that Mary returns to New York, to her pleasant career girl routine, and to Waldo. Mary! Hello, Waldo. Welcome, thrice welcome. We better get out of here. Uh, I, I have something in this box for you. I'll take your luggage. Excuse us, please. I trust you feel completely rejuvenated. <clears throat> there are a great many things at the office that uh, require attention. What's the matter? Uh, Waldo, I've got to tell you something. Yes, my dear. Then I'll be going back to Philadelphia. To Philadelphia? Three o'clock, didn't you? He better be here at three, and he better sign that contract. He will. We'll need the money. Good news, honey. Graham, you could tell the old man. But, 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 but you. Now, what kind of language is that? Yeah, but, but Waldo. What about Waldo? Does that answer your question? The ring never belonged there in the first place. It belonged to my mother, really. I just switched it. Well, Bill Roberts, you've got the ball. Now carry it. This is the mysterious destination to which the stranger has lured Fred Schroeder. What connection is there between this bit of Pennsylvania countryside and far off Korea? I still don't know why you wanted me to come here. I wanted us both to come here because there's a message here we both need. What message? Who are you, anyway? Come to think of it, I don't even know your name. Almost a hundred years ago when he came to Gettysburg, in this very town. You're comfortable, Mr. President? Mrs. Wills and I want this night to be as easy for you as it will be memorable for us. That's very kind of you, Judge. I'm afraid they'll expect you to make a few remarks, Mr. President. I'd better save my few remarks for tomorrow. Is there anything else? No, uh, yes, there is something else. Would you request the band to play Dixie for me? Dixie? Mr. President. Dixie, sir? Somehow I think it would be a fitting thing at this time, in this place. Fellow citizens, the President is very tired, and he'd like to be excused until tomorrow. He asks that the band play Dixie. Dixie! What does he mean by that? Does he know that Gettysburg's in Pennsylvania? Why? They seem to like it. Why not? It's a mighty fine tune. I think you can hear it here. Listen. I don't hear anything. I don't listen. Think. From beside that monument. That's where Abraham Lincoln stood to deliver his Gettysburg Address. You can hear the murmur of the crowd gathered before the speaker's platform. They're quieting now. He's coming forward. You can hear him now. Four score and seven years ago, our fathers brought forth on this continent a new nation, conceived in liberty and dedicated to the proposition that all men are created equal. Now we are engaged in a great civil war, testing whether that nation or any nation so conceived and so dedicated can long endure. We are met 
on a great battlefield of that war. We have come to dedicate a portion of that field as a final resting place for those who here gave their lives that that nation might live, that from these honored dead, we take increased devotion to the cause for which they gave the last full measure of devotion that we here highly resolve that these dead shall not have died in vain, that this nation under God shall have a new birth of freedom, and that government of the people, by the people, and for the people shall not perish from the earth. Did you hear that, Schroeder? Did you hear that? That was a message we both needed. That these dead shall not have died in vain. They wonder sometimes, those who gave that last full measure of devotion, if the people who inherited this country are worth the sacrifice. Well, I've seen both now. I've seen the country and the people. They're worthy of each other. You've made me understand, too. You have made me proud. Proud and humble. I'm glad. Look after Jimmy, will you? I'll see you in Washington. Of course. And I want to thank... I wanted you here with me, Jimmy. That's the tomb of the unknown soldier. The guard always there? Always. And over there lie other heroes. The unknown of the war between the states and other wars. Is this where we're supposed to meet him? I thought we might. He said he'd see us again. Come to think of it, he didn't say we'd see him. Kind of strange, but nice. I wonder what he does. I don't know, Jimmy. But whatever it is, I have a feeling his job is done. And to think we never even knew his name. His name? Like the words of President Harding when he dedicated this spot, the name of him whose body lies here took flight with his imperishable soul. We know only that his death marks him with the everlasting glory of an American who died for his country.